Hi, welcome to the eighth and final video in the marketing strategy course. Now, obviously, we are looking at taking our strategy and putting it into action. Let's do a quick recap on what we've covered so far. So we have an overall marketing strategy, which is what do we want to achieve, our strategic objective, right? And the strategy itself is how we're going to achieve that objective through the means of selling. That's why it's marketing. We have developed, designed a marketing concept. This is our basic proposition that we are going to take to the market that combines our brand, our products and services, the propositions, promises to solve a problem, problems and markets. Okay. Then we've gone over that, checked that it's valid, that it's present, that it's distinctive, and then we've tried, done what we can to upgrade each of those components to try and make our overall offer something brilliant and remarkable. We have developed our campaign design as a step-by-step -step plan of how we are going to meet our prospects wherever they are on the path. And then we've planned how we are going to achieve all of the steps that they need to go through in order to get to the destination. And we're gonna walk with them to the destination listening where we need to listen and communicating to them everything that we need to communicate in order to get them to the point where they are convinced that what we are offering is the right thing for them, it's going to solve their problem and that they need to take action and they need to take action now. So, what works? This is what we are concerned with right now. Because we are at a point where we have speculated. We have designed. And design takes things we know from the past that have worked in the past and it takes things from the future as well that we think may work. Now things that worked in the past don't necessarily work today and things that you know we, we pull in from the future don't necessarily work at all. What marketing is concerned with is this question what works? And we have to be honest and acknowledge that we don't know absolutely what works right now or whether our campaign is going to work. Now, you can't just ask people how they are going to behave. And this image gives you um, a really good example. I think this, pretty sure this came from a book called Love Marks, which was written by Kevin Roberts, who is a CEO worldwide of Saatchi's. And, uh, and this story came from that book. So basically, in the 1980s, Sony uh, had their sports Walkman. If you're as old as I am, you'll remember it. Big, chunky, yellow, waterproof, portable cassette player. And it had special sideways earphones, quite radical at the time. Very, very popular products. And they wanted to bring out a kind of ghetto blaster uh, boombox um, and a sports version of that, which are also very popular things at the time, these portable music systems. But they couldn't decide, should we make it in black, should we make it in yellow? So they did something that was fashionable at, at the time, still, still used today, which was a focus group. So they got a bunch of people together, represent their target market, they got them in a room, and they asked the people, would you go for a yellow one, would you go for a black one? And it's pretty unanimous, apparently, in the group, that people thought it should be yellow because the sports Walkman was yellow. So they said thank you very much and they sent them out. What they didn't tell them was on the way out, there were two tables. So as they left, they said, um, as a thank you for doing this for us, we would like you to take you know, a, a gift on your way out. And there were two tables. There was one that had black sports ghetto blasters, another one that had yellow ones, Apparently, everyone took a black one. So they, what they said was that they thought the yellow one was a good idea in principle. When it came to making a decision on the spot in real time, every mother's son there picked up a black one. Right? Bottom line is, do not trust what people say they're going to do about how they would behave in a hypothetical situation. The only thing that matters is what works. What do they actually do in reality when it counts? Okay. So what we're talking 
about today, before we can actually you know, light the touch paper and go to market, some final pre-flight checks. Firstly, we need to plan for the unknown, right? I want you to set up a lookout. Now, this is a security system. And then finally, we're going to deliver an extra shot of awesome, okay? Planning for the unknown. There should be unknowns. If there are no unknowns, you're playing it too safe. And safe is the new risky. And if you're playing safe, you're probably basing your decisions on what has worked, maybe for you, maybe for others, but certainly in the past. And the present day is not the past, so you're taking a risk whatever happens, okay? And the, the rules change all the time. At the same time, what you're doing shouldn't be overextended, and it shouldn't feel like you're, you know, betting the farm on this, right? Yes, there is, there should be an element of risk because you should be trying something that is new. If you're not trying something that's new, you're not trying, okay? So there have to be unknowns. You cannot research, plan, figure everything out before you start. It's impossible to do that. There, there just isn't enough time. There aren't enough resources to do that. And by the time you finish doing that, things will have moved on. The world will have changed and you'll need to start again. So marketing is not about figuring everything out before you start. Marketing is about figuring out what you can figure out before you start and figuring out the rest as you go along. Okay, that's the smart way to do it. You cannot plan for everything. You can plan for some things. But one thing you can plan for and should plan for is you must plan to test your assumptions. What that means is discovering what you don't know. There are certain things we're pretty sure about. There are certain things we're confident about. There are certain things that we are making an assumption on. And we need to plan to test that. And to do that is relatively simple, right? You write a list of what your assumptions are. Write a list of all the assumptions you have made in your strategy campaign design process as you've gone along. And then for each one of those, you go through that list and say, how can we test that? Simple. How can we test that? Now, what you don't want to be doing is building a complete marketing campaign out, right? Uh, with web pages and landing pages and follow-up sequences and the whole nine yards, right? And then with you know putting thousands and thousands and thousands into it, and then you know hitting the button and fingers crossed, hope that all this investment that we've put in pays off and works. That's not the smart way to do it, because there should always be. Shorter, quicker, leaner routes for discovering what you don't know other than building your entire empire on these assumptions and crossing your finger and praying. Okay, so you write down what the assumptions are. So the assumptions might be things like, you know, does anyone want our product? Do people actually have this problem? How many people actually are searching for this problem? Um, are those people active on Facebook? Are they active on Google? You know, so every single assumption. Will they try our free demo? Will they order the whatever? Will they put in their email address? And just be absolutely clinical and really, really strict with yourself about this and say, okay, what can we do? What can we do to test whether that assumption is correct or is pointing in the right direction? Okay, and there's so many different assumptions you can make. I can't possibly address them all, but at least having some kind of plan to say, okay, this is how we're going to test that. All right? We're going to put up a landing page. Or we're going to pay for some pay-per-click traffic, or we'll do an email shot, or whatever. We'll drive some traffic to that that campaign. Then we'll know that for every hundred visitors to that page, what you know, did they take an action? Didn't they take an action? And that ultimately. All of these assumptions, it all leads down to one thing, which is basically, you know, is our marketing going to work? Can we reach enough people who will take action? Ultimately, the action that we want them to take. 
Are there enough people? How many of those people will take action? And do we know where the heck they are? Can we reach them? And can we reach them in a cost-effective way? Right? This is marketing. So all marketing has ever been. Can we profitably sell to this group of people? And that's been the same for over 100 years. Can we reach enough people who will take action now? So, one scenario, if your market is at step one or beyond, step one means they are aware of a problem, but they're not aware of solutions. Step two is, yeah, we're aware that there are solutions, but we don't have a preferred one. We are considering solutions. Step three is then they're aware of your solution. Now, if they're at step one, two, which is very common for a market that you're trying to sell to, Google and the Google uh, AdWords planner, keyword planner, will tell you how many searches there are for phrases around that thing. Okay? But, <clears throat> oh yeah, and also the, as we said, the presence of pay-per-click ads, if you do a search for something around that, and if you see that people are advertising for that, how many ads are there, and whatever, the, the presence of those ads will tell you there is a market, because some people, not everybody, but most of those people should be making a profit off those clicks that they are having to pay Google for, right? But the fact that there are people searching for this thing does not mean that there are people who are willing to act on that thing, okay? So Google may say, yes, there's 10,000 to 100,000 people searching for this term per month, it doesn't mean that any one of those people, single one of those people, is actually going to take any kind of action, put their hand in their pocket, pay, right? Maybe they are just looking, maybe they're just researching. So if there is any assumption there about taking action, you need to prove that that's true. So this is Nadwood's field test. This is one way, possibly, one of the best ways that you can test assumptions out there in the market. It's down to you to come up with the most appropriate way for your business. It may not be AdWords at all. It may not be online. It may be a case of rocking up to a mall, a shopping center, or standing in the street with samples of your product and saying, to, will you try this? It may be writing by hand 50 letters and going pushing them through people's book uh, letter boxes, right? Asking them something, it, whatever it is. But the nature of the assumption that you've made will naturally lead to some ideas for how you can test it. So this is one that I like, AdWords field test. And this is gonna tell you four important things. How many people you can reach, okay? Now, AdWords will tell you Currently, depending on how much money you spend with them, but AdWords will tell you, um, at least within one order of magnitude, so that's a factor of 10, how many people are searching for phrases like the one that, that you've put in, right, per month. Now, that absolutely does not equate to how many people are actually searching for that phrase per month, right? Um, what Google tells you is the the size of a market for that thing is only loosely related to the actual size of the market. So, you know, we are only concerned now with actuals, not with forecasts, okay? We've got to have the actuals. So, if you bid for a particular phrase, and don't go really, really broad on it, right? You go for the, the phrases that you really think are gonna work, the phrases that say, I've got this problem and I'm desperate to solve it, okay? Um, and put more money into those, even if it means you know upping your bid, rather than just going really broad and, and just you know dredging the whole river. Okay, so what that will tell you is if I bid, and if I bid like three dollars, five dollars, or whatever per click, how many people actually type it in? Because Google will then tell you that with real numbers, and then how many people will click on it? Okay, so how many people can you reach? What is the initial cost likely to be? Because Google will give you a, um, a recommended bid, right? But you'd never go on that. I've never actually ended up paying anywhere near what Google tells me that I should be 
bidding for a term. But here's the important thing. At this point in time, with a field test, um, you're not necessarily trying to make a profit uh, because what you're doing is you're buying intelligence. You're buying market research at a relatively cheap rate from Google. Okay. The third thing is it's going to tell you whether they will do anything once they click through. And then finally, gives you a chance to test what approach actually appeals to them. And I've underlined the word, the word appeal because the word appeal is extremely important. You know, ultimately, the appeal is the hook that is going to get somebody's attention, that is going to get them expecting to have their problem addressed and solved when they get through. Right? People have said in advertising, you know, there is nothing more important than the than the appeal, and that is right. The appeal is the core of everything that we're doing. Right? It's it's saying it's it's like the core of your proposition. This thing will solve your problem. Bang. That's where they meet. Okay. We'll talk about this a bit more. And like I say, you don't have to make a profit. This is not the point, but you, you will get valuable and important market research data on what the pay-per-click cost is. Because it may be that you can then continue to use PPC down the line to drive traffic. If you can do that in a profitable way, that's great. So I'm going to take an example. Now I'm currently working on a project to do with back pain. So the client has a solution that can re relieve physical pain in many cases, not absolutely every case, but um, it worked for me. So this is using EFT tapping. It reduced my uh, tendonitis by over 90% and you know, I've got normal, normal use back of my, my right arm. Um, now, using the principle of pipes, this is, if you've read Convert, what this is talking about is multiplicity. Okay, so instead of going um, pain relief or pain, right, which is a, a big but vague, watery, washy market, we're going for specific things. So we want specific, urgent, I'm looking for a solution, all right? Um, and then if we can do that, and if we can discover that actually people searching for lower left back pain or lower back pain, right? Or lumbar back pain, or how can I get rid of back, you know, various things, then we can hone that, get that working, and then bang, 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 drop in more pipes, right? So for specific people who should drop straight through, we're not talking about funnels. Funnels builds in, it assumes that you're being wasteful and costly at every stage. We're going specific people, you sir, I know what your problem is, right? This will solve it, let me prove it, bang, sold, give me your money, right? And we do that, then it's elbow pain, knee pain, ankles, you know, ear, whatever it may be, right? So Google tells us that there are a lot of queries for back pain. Um, and remember that these numbers are not for that exact search these days, right? Not anymore. So lower back pain between 100,000 and a million globally, but including related terms. So the same for back pain generally. Lower back pain relief, you know, is an order of magnitude lower than that 10,000 to 100,000. Back pain causes. You notice the suggested bid for back pain causes is a lot lower because it's like more research oriented. Uh, lower back pain causes, again, cheaper, etc. So, you know, th there's whichever way you look at this, there's a heap of traffic there. And in fact, the SEO competition is not too strong. So, you know, what I would be looking to do is proving it by pushing traffic, paying for the traffic with pay per click first, and then over time supplanting the pay per click traffic with SEO traffic, which is um, not necessarily free, but it means you're not paying for every visitor specifically. And it's uh, slower to build up, but more long term. So the next thing that I would do would be to construct a number of ads targeting the, the very specific areas. Okay, so I would probably, you know, do 
a landing page for lower back pain, put a video on that, make sure that the headline, very importantly, the headline is going to match exactly what you expect to find on the page. And then I'm going to write a number of ads. And when I talk about a number of ads, I don't mean I'm going to write four ads in 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Then just hit go and carry on about, you know, with the next urgent thing that I need to do. When I'm talking about writing a number of ads, I'm talking about writing as many high quality ads as I can. And if it takes a day or two days, that is a day or two days well spent. So here's a method that you could use for, and this is, this is actually the method that I am using for preparing these pay-per-click ads for my field test, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm looking at three or four segments of the message, right? So I'm looking at things like, and really what we're trying to do here is we're primarily trying to test the appeal, okay? Can we get people to click? What are they clicking for? What makes them click the most? And from those who do click, which of them are likely to take action? Because, oh, I mean, ultimately, you don't want people who, you know, if I put out an ad which gets loads of people clicking, costing me loads of money, but they actually don't convert, that's less interesting to me than an ad that gets fewer clicks but more conversions. So ultimately, it's about the conversions, okay? So there are appeals that might get clicks and there are appeals that get sales. And we're interested in the appeals that get sales. So we're breaking the message down into things like, okay, what's the description of the problem? that really appeals? What is the, the eye-catching hook? What is the uh, usual um, difficulty or obstacle that you have to overcome that we can claim to disappear? Um, and how can we make this uh, uh, appear easy, cheap, accessible, achievable, whatever, right? So here, here goes a f just a few examples. All right. Okay, so yeah, this is just recapping. So we're going to have a landing page with a try it video and then specific actions off that page, right? So I have a call to action to purchase the full product, which will be ready because it's already done. Possibly a newsletter sign up, possibly a request for feedback. This is gold, right? Do not ignore this. You want to catch everybody who who doesn't go ahead and buy the full product, you want to say to them, you know, if you've got any questions at all about this, or if you can help in any way, please just you know put this in here. Even if they don't put in their email address, you want their feedback, you want their objections. This is one of the steps on the detailed awareness ladder, okay? benthunt.com slash AL2, right? Gather objections, incredibly important. If they're not gonna buy, what can you do to find out why they don't buy? Right, so we'll have a request for feedback, and make it really easy for them to do that. Okay, so spinning the ads. This text is going to be a little bit smaller because I've just crammed a load of stuff on one page. So, the first bit, the first bit of the ad, it could be how you can. Now there's an easy way to, revealed the quickest way to. Right, so it's like, you know, with any um, any offer that you put out. What is it doing? Is it offering relief? Is it offering high performance? Is it offering cheaper, quicker, better? You know, what is it? Easier. Okay. So there's all always lots of different ways in, different angles that you can take on a thing. So easy way or quickest way. The ancient secret. One simple technique that. Okay. I can show you how to. Or go straight for the problem. Don't let back pain ruin your life. This is an instruction. Reduce or eliminate even crippling back pain. Right? Now, all of this kind of copy should feel really quite familiar. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that people have been practicing this language for over 100 years, and you've seen a lot of it. Right? The reason you've seen a lot of it is because a lot of it works. Right? The, you, you don't want Shakespeare here. Okay? But... I have to stop myself, this is not a course in copywriting. But what I'm showing you is that we can make you know, multiple combinations of ads using lots of these components of the appeal. 
right? So why not start uh, early on with combining all these different angles? Because if you're going to be investing money in driving people to test your landing page, test your ads at the same time, for goodness sake, right? And watch them like a hawk. Okay, so that's your first section. And then we're going to be combining this with second section. So banish back pain. So this is like the promise, okay? How you can banish back pain. Now there's an easy way to banish back pain, right? Now, I have to say, not all of these combinations are going to make sense. And some of them are going to need to be tweaked and rewritten. Some of them will sound stupid, and you don't want to use those ones, okay? But you're all sensible, intelligent people, so we don't need to go through that, okay? Now there's an easy way to conquer back pain, or reveal the quickest way to conquer back pain, or ancient secret to conquer back pain, okay? You, you get the point. Say goodbye to back pain. No more back pain, right? Live pain-free. Enjoy life pain-free. So, you know, I can show you how to enjoy life pain-free, or I can show you how you can. Immediate and long-lasting relief is another one, okay? And then the promise on the other side, you've got and live free from back pain and get your life back, allowing you to live life to the full again. Or it could be in minutes, which is a, you know, um, ancient secret that, you know, lets you say goodbye to back pain in minutes. Right? You've got an ad there. Good ad. Without leaving your chair. What ways can we think of to say how easy or accessible or um, likely to succeed this thing is? Write them down. Do they make sense? Spin them into ads. Weave them together. Now there's an easy way to say goodbye to back pain using your body's power to heal itself. All right? Now, it, you know, it, it is important to say there's, there's a, a phrase, Chico, that we use. It stands for crap in, crap out. Take the time even when you're putting these components together, right, to delve into the, the actual problem, the actual impacts on the real human beings that are going to be typing this thing into Google. You know, there's people there that really care. They're not wasting, they're not, you know, spitballing. They, they really want this. Okay, so let's, let's honor that and put the time and the effort and the care from our side into writing this stuff, okay? By releasing your body's natural healing. Could work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine these things and then we're gonna be looking for the patterns of the ones that work the best, okay? How about this, All right? Don't let back pain ruin your life. Enjoy life pain-free or blah, 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 blah. That, that wouldn't, wouldn't work. But ancient secret to no more back pain that your doctor won't tell you, All right? Now there's an easy way to say goodbye to back pain that your doctor won't tell you. Or, uh, revealed the quickest way to banish back pain that even your chiropractor doesn't know. Right? Now, I also have to say at this point that you know, the, the ads that you put out there should be honest and truthful and legal. Right? So, that's my disclaimer. So, this is, this is the principle. Okay? And then you would you know, gather them at the end or as you go along and say, well, ancient secret seems to be working well. You know, people like ancient secret, but you know, enjoy life pain free is working well. And you can mix them up and, and whatever, you can, you know, change the order of these, but you know, ultimately this will give you, this kind of approach will give you a good um, structure for creating these ads and for importantly testing your appeals. So you run your field test, you want to know the basic things. How many people actually see the ads compared to how many people Google says are going to be searching for them? Okay. How many actually click? How many take action? Buy or follow up or provide feedback? And really importantly, what do we learn from that feedback? And also how far off profitability are we? I said earlier on, you shouldn't expect to be profitable at this point because you are learning. There should be other people who are not at this stage, who are already in the market, who have been through this kind of process, who are 
you know, have mature campaigns that should be making money, and those people ought to be able to outbid you. So if you are outbidding them to get the clicks that they were getting previously, you see where I'm going with this, right? You shouldn't be expecting to convert that traffic as well as they can convert that traffic. Right? So you shouldn't expect to be making money at this point. So you should be actually committing an amount of money to lose, but you're not actually losing it because what are we doing? We're buying intelligence. Okay? So but the key is, well, okay, we are we are spending, you know, two dollars for every dollar we make. Okay, great. That's useful information. That means that we know that we have to reduce our bids or we have to increase our conversion rates through conversion rate optimization or whatever and we have to you know look at making um increasing our lifetime customer value so for every customer that we get how can we actually make more from them over time cool so that's that's the that's the first thing planning for the unknown okay if you don't plan for the unknown who knows what could happen you don't all right Second thing, this is a very short one, set up a lookout, okay? What this means is that part of the unknown is that something could go wrong, and we need to know what could go wrong, all right? If something does go wrong, we need to be alerted about it, okay? So part of planning for the unknown is planning for the possibility of failure, right? The crew of the Titanic didn't do this well enough, right? Now, We've said right at the beginning when we were looking at the phases of a marketing campaign that we, you know, we think expansively, we make decisions, we start to execute our campaign, and then we review our strategy, but we review it periodically. We don't review it every single goddamn day. If we start sitting down and going, well, how is our strategy doing and what can we change every day? What's our path going to look like? It's going to look like this, right? We're going to have scribble. Our trajectory is going to be scribble. It's going to be worthless. Partly um, because your strategy needs a, ch a chance to prove itself. Right? If you take a little bit of feedback and panic and think, oh, what can we do about this? Well, maybe you haven't been doing it for long enough. Maybe your message hasn't had time to resonate. Maybe people haven't had time to think about what you're saying to them and to get back to you, right? So, you know, we have to plan for enough time for our strategy to have the effect we think it's going to have, okay? And at the same time, obviously we can't keep changing it, right? But if we are heading for the iceberg and catastrophic failure, i.e. running out of cash, right? we need to have an early warning system. And that's what our lookout is. So, here's my advice. Right? Before we press the big red button and launch our campaign, set a measure of success. So the measure of success is going to be what, right? You know, we've made, or, so if you're, if you're selling something, if you're actually selling something, then your measure of success should be, you know, this is our ROI. This is how much revenue we've made per dollar cost, right? Basic, makes sense. If you're not actually selling something, then you need to pick a different measure of success. So it could be this many people have joined our mailing list, or this many people have downloaded the free report, or whatever it may be, okay? And pick a date. And this is giving you the freedom to move and the freedom just to focus on what you've got to do day to day without trying to strategize day to day, right? That's not a hat that you wear every day. It's a hat that you should wear periodically to say, okay, you know, like we, we've been saying, you know, the truth shall set you free. These are the facts. Let's step back, acknowledge the facts and then be honest about what the facts tell us, and then we make a decision, right? That's what we've been doing throughout this whole process of strategy campaign design. And that's the same thing that we need to do when we are actually rolling out a campaign. But you don't do that all the time, because sometimes you have to be a worker bee. Sometimes you have to be digging the hole, right? 
Sometimes you have to be the soldier on the ground, not the general on the hill, particularly when it's a small business and you're doing it yourself. So pick a date, however long in the future you think will be long enough to have generated reasonable returns. Okay. Now, if you have set up your campaign that if you haven't you know, broken even within week one, you're heading for the rocks, I would suggest you've done it wrong. Because marketing, like, like we're saying, is not a process of getting it right first time. If you want to get it right first time, go and, go and do something else. Right? Marketing is about, yes, doing your best and learning what you don't know as you go along. Reviewing, revising, improving, optimizing as you go. And it's difficult. It is, it, I'll acknowledge it is difficult and it's not for everyone. And it takes, you know, a certain amount of courage and it also takes, you know, so courage to push through and also courage to say, nope, this isn't working. Why isn't it working? Who can I listen to? You know, preferably your customers. Um, what intelligence can we get? And let's make the right decision. Okay. It's, this is basically it's management. So the way I want you to think about it is it's like your campaign is a huge container vessel. Right? It's a big old tanker of a thing. And it takes a long time to turn this thing around. Right? Now, if you try and turn the ship this way, that way, constantly on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, then like we say, your, your journey is, you're not going to get very far, put it that way, right? If you're constantly reacting, you're not really going to learn that much either because you're only going to have a short, a small amount of data for each time before you've, you know, screamed and, and changed things again. So you've got to have long enough to get a reasonable amount of data and intelligence back from the market to know what you're doing. Um, at the same time, if you realize that you are, you know, you, you want to head for point B and you're not heading for point B, the further you go before you change course, the further away you're going to be from point B, right? that doesn't make sense just draw it on a piece of paper quickly okay you start at a you head in a direction where you think you need to go and more than likely it's not the that exact direction okay and but point b is somewhere else the further you go the further away you're going to be getting from that point okay compared to if you change direction now but this is a thing that's you know not that easy and quick to change direction particularly if you've spent you know, invested a lot of time and resources in building out a big old dinosaur of a campaign. Okay, so think lean. Please try and do it lean. How quickly, boldly can we learn the lessons that we need to learn that are vital so that we can make those corrections fairly early on, right? So that we can head with confidence to our destination. So that's, that's it. You, you need to plan for your early warning system, have a lookout on the top of the ship to tell you if you're heading in the wrong direction, okay? But don't react on a daily basis. Okay, final thing we need to do. Now, if, if you know that your stuff is utterly awesome at this point, you can stop watching now because you've finished. Okay, that's cool. But I would encourage you to listen to the end because I love awesome. And I think it is the secret source. And I think it's, you know, vastly underestimated. And there's lots of people that really want you to buy into their step-by-step -step system or buy into their software, telling you that that thing is going to solve your marketing problem for you, when in fact the reality of what is going to solve your marketing problem for you is that you're not awesome enough. Okay. And the other thing is that awesome isn't as hard as we think. And the other thing is that the reason the gurus are not trying to sell you awesome is because you've already got it and they can't bottle it and sell it back to you. Your awesome is already there. 
if you're not in touch with your awesome, then it, what's most likely is that you've been playing at being someone else. And this, by the way, when I talk about you, this could be, if you're a solo person, this could be you, right? If you are your business, I'm talking to you and your business. But it also applies to a business, it applies to a business culture. A lot of businesses are trying to be something they're not. A lot of businesses don't have a clue who the heck they are and haven't decided, right? But there is all, I believe there's awesome in every human being. And I think that if you get a bunch of, you know, awesome human beings together, they can make an awesome team and an awesome business, right? If that isn't the case, go and do something else. I love this. This is called Curly's Law, right? We've been talking about finding your thing, right? What is the thing that I should be doing? And so this comes from a movie, City Slickers. I don't know when, it's from late 80s, early 90s. So this this rough old, beaten up old cowboy played by Jack Palance says, you know what the secret to life is? One thing, just one thing. Once you figure it out, you stick to that. Everything else don't mean shit, All right? Your one thing, what is your one thing? And we've talked about uh, good to great, the awesome Jim, Jim Collins book. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, wear out the word awesome, and I uh, apologize in advance. It's my kind of word of the week, okay? But uh, good to great talks about the flywheel, talks about the hedgehog principle. Find your one thing in marketing, and do it, and do it, and do it, right? Curly's law: find your one thing, figure it out, stick to it. I found this quote for the first time, like the other day, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. Don't ask what the word world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. It's from Dr. Howard Thurman, he was a civil rights activist, theologian, writer, teacher, all round, amazing human being. So this is really worth meditating on, I think, right? Don't ask what the world needs. If you ask what the world needs, you're not on your edge. You're behind your edge. You're in the past already, right? You're looking around at other people and what they're doing, right? Ask what makes you come alive and do that. There's really nothing else to say on it. <clears throat> so... Finding your thing, we've talked about it quite a lot. I don't think there's anything less to, left to say. But, you know, with the time I have left with you, I want to drill home the power and the importance of awesomeness. Okay, so awesome autopilot. This is basically saying that awesomeness is the, it's the oil that makes the whole thing work, right? If you haven't got the awesomeness oil in your system, then there's going to be friction and it's going to take a lot more effort to get the results out. But awesome actually accelerates and improves constantly. It generates this real positive um, cycle that goes on. Okay, so just, just let these things sink in. It's easier to be something that means a lot to you than it is to do something you don't care about, right? It's obvious. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. Everything is easier. When you are able to be, or you, let's say give yourself the permission to be the highest version and the highest vision of yourself. Right? Who are you called to be? Bang. Your heart just said it. Right? Who am I called to be? Okay? It's in there already, okay? And when you say, okay, I'm gonna do that. That's me, that is me. I accept my calling, right? Everything gets easier. And doing an awesome job does your marketing for you, okay? So when we're saying be awesome, that means that what you do is awesome, right? That your client's experience of you, every customer has an amazing experience of you. Okay, page two. Doing an awesome job makes happy customers. What do we know about happy customers? Happy customers are the best possible advert for your business. 
the worst possible advert for your business is unhappy customers. Okay, what does it take to delight your customers? Now, there's two things here. One is don't pick customers that you can't delight. All right. And the second thing is do what it takes to delight your customers. All right? Because happy customers are the best advert for your business. Awesome results and happy customers make awesome case studies and testimonials. Case studies are incredibly powerful because case studies prove that what you're selling works. This customer had this problem. We spoke about it. We investigated the root causes. We put together a plan. We implemented the plan. Problem went away. Customer's doing amazingly well. Customer's life is transformed. That's the end of the case study, right? Now, I haven't there sold myself. I haven't said, because we're so goddamn awesome, etc., etc. No. Customer had the problem. We did this stuff. We did our stuff. Problem went away. Done. Okay? So the subtext of all of that is, hey, if I've got a problem like that, I could come to you and we could do the same kind of thing that you did for those guys for me and my life will be transformed. Yes. Case studies are incredibly powerful. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that you can think about is, is to make your business into a testimonial making machine. Okay. If every single thing that you do is purposefully directed around the question, right? How can we get an awesome case study or testimonial from this, what we do? Then you are almost certain to succeed. Awesome results make awesome case studies. Awesome case studies attract awesomer customers. And if you've got a niche, right? If you are the person that does this boom or the business that is the one for that thing and gets these results, you will start attracting the customers who really want what you offer. And if you do it really well, you can even get those customers applying to you. They could be coming, they could be seeking you out instead of you seeking them out. All right? That's like what we think about marketing all changes. That's changing the whole game. All right? So, you know, change the game. Don't play, you know, don't assume that marketing is about paying for clicks, building a mailing list. All right? Maybe that you can cheat. <laughs> Maybe you can just say, no, do you know what? I can't be bothered with all that stuff. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something that's so awesome that people are, are gonna, so many people are gonna be talking about what I do and the results that I get that people are gonna come to me. Doesn't that sound exciting? Page three. Awesome is distinctive. We try a lot to say, okay, well, what's distinctive about your business? Well, uh, we're customer focused, All right? We see, we see a lot of that around. Business is trying to be distinctive. Awesome is already distinctive. You've solved that problem, check, done. Awesome is memorable. Think of a marketing campaign, All right? It's an awesome one, right? Because the rubbish ones we've forgotten about. We can't remember them. The ones that stick in your head are memorable. By definition, awesome is memorable. So let's be awesome because we've solved that memorable problem. Awesome makes your SEO and social media problems go away as well. It's, it's doing your marketing for you. Awesome gets people linking and sharing. And I am not making this up because I'm going to prove it to you in a second. Awesome does that stuff for you and you don't have to do it and you don't have to pay for it. Right? Awesome gets people following you, gets people wanting to join your mailing list 
And the best part is all of those benefits don't cost much more. In fact, are probably cheaper, right? Don't tell everyone else, but it's probably cheaper than going down the default route of investing in the software and paying for the clicks and all this stuff that you have to do. Okay, so I'm, I've done what I can to drive home the fact that if you do something that's incredible, then a lot of your marketing problems, which, you know, it's like working against friction. No, just oil it with awesome. And let's have this machine purring, okay? So a lot of people think, oh, how can we be unique, right? Where is the clear blue water? What is our unique point of difference or unique selling point? And let's argue about, you know, USP is a unique selling proposition or unique selling points. Stop it. Stop it. Doesn't matter. Okay? Because awesome isn't about being different. I uh, In the city where I live, we've got two universities. And I just always remember growing up in this university, in, in, in this city, Sheffield, right? And every September, seeing the year one university students all rocking up for that first week, for Freshers' Week. And it's always amused me because there's, there's always a section, there's like 10% of these people who've decided I'm going away from home for the first time, I'm going to uni, right? I need to be different. And they all end up dressed the same. They all show up with Dr. Martin's boots and ripped clothes and purple hair, right? This is, this, I'm thinking back to the 90s. But it's like, they're all trying... So trying so hard to be different, they all end up like a uniform. It's like we're the different party. It's like, no, you're not. You all look the fucking same. You know, it's absolutely hilarious. So being your awesome self is not about trying to be different. Because when you're trying to be different, what you do is you look around for information on how to be different. So well, I need to be different to that person, different to that person, different to my parents, different to my teachers. And you probably look around and see people who you think are different. And you think, well, that's what different looks like. So I'm going to be like that. Well, you're, that's not different, is it? You're going to look like those people. Your, finding your uniqueness is not about different. It's about unique. There's, there's already nobody like you. The thing is, can you be you? Can you be your true you? Now, so I said I was going to prove some stuff to you. This is really cool. Found this literally in the last few days. This guy owns a micro pub in the south of England. <clears throat> so he serves, you know, local beer, small pub. He's completely independent of the breweries, right? So his stand, we've talked about the importance of being something, taking a stand to the world. His stand is micropubs, right? Um, individual choice, individuality for beer drinkers and, and his customers. So he has done something rather unusual. He's created a disloyalty card, okay? And you go to his pub and you get a disloyalty card. And he has... Um, on that card or whatever, he will tell you about a number of different independent small-scale pubs in that area. And if you go to those pubs and they stamp your disloyalty card, right? so you've gone drinking at a different establishment, they stamp your card, you bring it back and you've you know been to five of those establishments, he will give you a free drink. Right? So... That is not how loyalty cards are supposed to work. I don't know about you, but I remember a point in time when I had a loyalty card from every major supermarket in my wallet. What's loyal about that? No. This is disloyalty card. This is awesome. So the guy gets press. This is literally, yeah, from like last couple of days. Freedman Micropub Landlord tells his customers to go elsewhere. So he's getting links. He's getting traffic. I know about this. And if I get the chance, I want to drink in his pub because it sounds brilliant. Right? I want to go and show my support. If I'm somebody, 
that is a stand for small independent brewers and small independent establishments, but he's got me. Do you get it? It's the two ends of the circuit, right? Who is his target market? Fiercely independent beer drinkers, right? Who is my brand? It's the freed man. Great name. Zap, right? When that brand and that target market have that connection, the energy goes through. That's why it's called the circuit. The energy flows round and round and round. Love it. I'm sure everyone knows what this is. Obviously, it's an ashtray from a BMW 7 Series. It may or may not be. This is from another story that I heard. It may have also been in the Love Marks book. I'm, I'm not sure because I haven't read it for a while. Um, I'll tell you the story because I love it. So there's a well-to-do businessman. He's just ordered a brand new BMW. And it came without the ashtray. It came with the other things that can go in the slot where the ashtray should be. And he wanted the ashtray. And he was upset. So he phones the BMW franchise and says, you've delivered my 7 Series and it doesn't have the ashtray and I wanted it with the ashtray. They say, well, terribly sorry, sir. Uh, we will replace it for you. He said, well, okay. Um, that's, that's great. And they said, okay, it'll be two weeks. And he said, you what? What do you mean two weeks? So it's going to take us two weeks to order, okay. Puts the phone down. Now, the guy is a clever guy and he phones up Rolls-Royce. And he says, you know, I've just had this experience. How long would it take you to replace an ashtray for one of your things? He, the Rolls Royce say, we'll do it straight away if we can or whatever. He phones up Mercedes. He phones up Lexus. He phones up Jaguar and has the same conversation with each of them. Right, puts the phone down. Two hours later, his doorbell rings. And he goes to answer the door. And there's a guy there in overalls that said, sir, here's your ashtray. And you can understand what's going through the guy's mind. He's like, he said, I can't believe you people, right? What, what is BMW like? I, I, I've just spent the, you know, a huge amount of money, most, more than most people's salaries, on a brand new BMW. I phone you up. You say it's going to take two weeks to get me the ashtray, right? Brand new customer. This is how you treat your customers, right? And then, you know, because I complained to you, oh yeah, because he phoned them back up and said, I've just spoken to your competitors and they've said they can blah, 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 right? And then this guy turns up, he bores the guy out and he says, you know, you, you guys at BMW are terrible, you know? How can you explain this? And the, and the guy standing on the other side of the door says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, I, I, I can't answer that because I'm from Lexus. So the guy's just shelled out for a, a brand new BMW. The people at Lexus understood something that the people at BMW didn't understand. And that is that there is nothing more important than doing an awesome job for your ideal customer. This guy's just shelled out however much money on a brand new 7 Series, right? This guy is likely to be trading in his car in two to three years time, right? Maybe even before that. What's the bet that ne when he trades in his car, he's gonna get a Lexus next time, okay? Hans Brinker Budget Hotel in Amsterdam. A colleague and friend told me about this the other day. I hadn't come across it before. This is brilliant stuff, right? Hans Brinker Budget Hotel in Amsterdam costs 22, 22 euros 50 per night and calls itself, proudly announces itself as the world's worst hotel. And this is what their advertising says. Our maids work twice as hard since we only have one. Upgrades. Now, as much free water as you like. Now, free key with your room, right? They have got history of these ads look them up they're brilliant okay it, there's one something like you know our service can't get any worse but we're working on it they pride themselves on how bad the hotel is they they tell customers to dry themselves on the curtains okay it's it's just fantastic and it's incredibly popular
right? Because it's talking directly to the target market. The, the, the target market is students and backpackers who want the cheapest service and expect it to be crappy. But this is almost celebrating the crappiness. It's absolutely wonderful. It's taking a negative and, in a genius way, spinning it into a positive. And it gets people talking about it. And people have been talking about this place for years. I never even knew about it. It's absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> this is a guy called Ben. You may not know who he is, but you probably know his job. Because his job is the best job in the world. Okay, so in January 2009, Tourism Queensland, so Queensland's a northeastern state in Australia, and they needed somebody to come as a caretaker to live on basically a tropical island off the Great Barrier Reef and to do various scientific work on the island. Okay, now they had a tiny budget, and when I mean a tiny budget, they had a tiny budget right they had a classified ad level of budget but what they also had was they had awesome so they were offering a six-month contract offering a pro rata salary of 150,000 Australian dollars rent free luxury island accommodation and the opportunity to discover and report back to a worldwide audience of what the region had to offer the ad was that the best job in the world. Now, here's the thing. They could have offered this job for 50,000 Australian dollars. Right? But they offered it for 150,000. And I think that's important, which is a good, you know, good amount of money. It's like it's about 80,000 US dollars I think at the time, something like that. Okay, position vacant island caretaker, location islands of the Great Barrier Reef, Queensland, Australia, salary, etc. Anyone can apply. The, ra the ad ran in multiple languages. It's seen in Japanese and seen, you know. People picked up on this all around the world. It's the best job in the world. It's not a good job. It's the best job in the world, right? That is awesome and that got people's attention. So this thing ran and it ran so much. On the day the applications opened, the website got 4 million hits. Right In the first hour, or in one hour that day, four million people trying to apply crashed the website. Okay, It's absolutely fantastic. So this is what we're talking about. Awesome gives you exponential returns. Think about the 80-20 curve, or think about the 95-5 curve. Right? These things that, that we've been looking at, right? the world's worst hotel, the world's best job, or the pub that tells people not to drink there, these are right up at the, you know, this end, the top end. They are up at the end where the return for being absolutely awesome, it eclipses even the return on being really, really good. Talking about awesome. We're talking about awesome to the level that, you know, you, you get Facebook goes crazy, that people link to you. And all that just keeps bringing traffic back and back and back. Right? People just want to share your story. Okay? It's just pretty straightforward. So here are a few examples of questions that, that you can ask yourself, and there are lots, lots more. What can nobody else claim? What can nobody else do? What is nobody else willing to do? How can we surprise and delight our customers? How can we surprise and delight our customers even more than that? What is the last thing that our customers would expect? Right? So surprise is really important. If I had all the time and all the money in the world, those things didn't matter, what would I do to surprise and delight my customers? What would put a smile on their face? What would get them to laugh out loud? What story do I want them to tell to their friends when they're down the pub? What story? So I've just told you a story about an ashtray and a car and a mechanic, okay? The reason I wanted to tell you that story is it's an awesome story. And I bet that some of you who are hearing this today are going to tell that story to other people, right? So what story do I want them to tell their friends and what story 
will their friends look forward to sharing with other people as well? Okay, so I can't, I can't keep underlying it anymore, right? The importance of, of doing something that is remarkable, but it's remarkable because it's you, but it's you 100%. So I'm, I'm talking about the Superman you, not the Clark Kent you, right? A lot of us will go through a lot of our lives not using our superpowers, right? We're acting Clark Kent. We are hiding our true identity under a boring suit. We are pretending to be less than we are in order to fit in and not be noticed, okay? Now, if that works for you, brilliant. But I hope that I have made it very, very clear that in marketing, just rip open that shirt, okay? Be your super identity. If you haven't seen the movie Jerry Maguire, I advise you to watch it. Um, just, you know, on, on the back of this video if you can, just for inspiration, right? It's just a wonderful movie and you'll enjoy it, okay? There are a lot of excuses that we can make to uh, to stop us from doing what it takes to surprise and delight our customers. But all I can say to you is that the return on investment for surprising and delighting your customers, if you aren't trying to surprise and delight the wrong people, okay, is so great. And I think there's no better example than literally the, for the price of a classified ad, you get worldwide PR coverage for years. Okay, that's what's possible with the imagination and guts to follow it through. Okay, there are a lot of excuses we can make. It's too much time. It's too costly. Now, that guy, for that guy to get hold of a BMW part and to drive it to the customer's house. What did that cost, right? Two or three hours of their time. That could have earned them a $100,000 car sale within a couple of years. I call that a great return on investment. And, and that's the thing, right? The, the, the effort it takes to go that, ex that extra mile um, is nothing compared to the return that you can get for that time. So if there's one thing I, I want to leave you with today, it's only one more mile. It's only one more mile. Right? Yeah, tattoo that on the inside of your eyelids. What will it take to take each customer and plan, plan for an awesome experience for each customer? Plan for an ex awesome experience for one customer rather than an average experience for 10 because that one customer could bring you 10 awesome customers, okay? So we have reached the end of our journey and this is what we have covered. You start off big beat by being absolutely clear where you want to go first. If you don't know to, what, to which port you are sailing, no wind is favorable. Be clear, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What do you actually want to achieve? What does success look like? You set out with an awesome concept using the circuit. You try and max it up, right? We, we design a comprehensive experience. I know exactly who my customer is. I know exactly where they are on the road. I'm going to walk up to them. I'm going to bond with them instantly, get their attention. I'm going to earn their trust. We are gonna to walk together down that road to the destination and we take every step there. There are not massive holes in this road. We know what we have to do. We prepare for it. And we plan to discover what we don't know along the way. We haven't walked that path with that person. There may be assumptions, there must be assumptions. And we are going to plan for how we are going to keep our eyes open, learn the intelligence that we don't yet have, so that we can respond in an appropriate way, in an intelligent way. And we're gonna set up a lookout so that in case 
something drastically happens that means that our strategy is wrong. We're going to know about it and we're going to be able to do something about it. And then we're going to review sensibly. Over time, we're put in say, how is this working? Right? We're not going to try and change it every day because then that's just going to burn up all our resources. But we are always going to be open to change because the one thing that you can count on is that change happens. And that's it. I want to leave you with this little quote from Lord of the Rings. There is nothing like looking if you want to find something. You certainly usually find something if you look, but it is not always quite the something that you're after. And, and that's it. You know, we can, we can plan as much as we can plan. We can research, we can talk to people, we can get, gather all the intelligence and information that we can. And then we have to step out of our front door onto that journey. And you never know quite where that journey is going to take you. But be alert, be aware, and bottom line, enjoy the ride. And you know what? If you're doing what you really love and what you really care about for people that you care about, you're going to enjoy the ride. Okay. And that's it. You know, eventually, at some point, you just have to leap. You just have to take, take the jump. Okay. Prepare all you can. And then there's a time when your preparation is done and you just have to go for it. So I would, you know, I want to thank you for coming on this journey with me. I've had an amazing time putting this course together and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you are excited and that you you have this feeling about marketing that it's not just the numbers game and it's not just the grind and you're not just putting meat in the top of the machine turning the handle and waiting for stuff to come out that it can be a lot more exciting and thrilling than that so thank you again for your time bye-bye